liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waltman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waltman. Well, now is now. So I guess that's it. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's Wednesday, April 20th, 2022. It's now. So, you know, we have to go. It's time for another show. I'm just checking out here uh, the news that is flying by uh, just to see what's new because that's that's really the root word of news. And so I thought I would check that out and maybe provide that to you. Uh, and I, I see Justice giving his usual heads up and usually... Uh, Cracks a couple of jokes in the morning just to keep things loose about what's in the headlines today. And I don't know what this is. Look at this one. This is a great one. Uh, it, the, it says here, you know, he always is joking about the, the music coming through, just letting me know that everything is uh, coming through loud and clear. And so he says, intro says, you know, the intro doesn't actually say this. But the joke today is the poisoned lucky charm is shaped like a Q. And I'm like, oh, my God, what am I missing? I don't know what the story is yet. So we'll check it out. Maybe, uh, send, I don't know, send me something on this. What is this one? Have we been, uh, I've missed some story. Probably it looks like about six of them in this one. Uh, but it's easy to miss, uh, even a, even a big story these days because there's so many things going on and all of them are so crazy and all of them deserve a certain amount of attention. Uh, unfortunately, some of them deserve time spent telling you not to pay attention to this story so i don't know i'm not certain how to I'm certain how to handle those things but uh there are many such stories out there i'm trying to discern between the good ones and the bad ones and i'm not uh, we're not always going to be successful with that but the good news the good definitely good news is that i spent a little time with libsyn tech support yesterday and it seems like everything is back online with our uh, good friends in the podcasting world. I haven't yet, well, I'm going to check right now as we're speaking to see whether Stitcher is back online, but the, the great tech support people at Libsyn, and they really did a fantastic job on this, very quickly turning this around. I was, I was stumbling around trying to figure it out myself and thinking that perhaps the problem was uh, related to their their statistics difficulties their statistics routine from the other day they had a bit of a crash but I, it, it wasn't related i thought it would resolve itself and it hasn't but the good news is that uh, the tech people once i finally put them on the case you know they can drag their feet sometimes not libsyn in, in in particular but tech support in general very often overwhelmed by the number of requests and probably i mean tech support will probably tell you uh, the overwhelming number of requests are, are stupid requests that are easily answered if people would look at the frequently asked questions. So I always try to do that. But then again, the answers to the frequently asked questions are written by tech people who to whom all tech things are obvious. And sometimes you don't quite get the answer you need. So I was a little embarrassed, but I did ask them. But it was a, it was a genuine problem that they spotted and spotted very quickly. And I would never have thought to look there, although in hindsight, it seems kind of obvious. I knew that the feed got cut off on April 11th. I should have been poking around in the files from April 11th to find this thing. Stray bit of website coding that got caught up when I uh, take Scott's show summary from his post on Daily Coast. I cut and paste, copy and paste the text of his summary into the appropriate area on Libsyn's servers, and I guess in in the copy and paste operation, I accidentally grabbed some site coding from the display at Daily Coast and included that and pasted that in, and whatever that is, that did it. That broke the RSS feed, but you had to know, you know, where to look and what you were looking at, and it wasn't immediately obvious, but they found it, and correct, we've corrected it. And everything seems to be on the up and up. It looks to me like Apple Podcasts is caught up. Google Podcasts is caught up. Stitcher, something's still going on with Stitcher. Stitcher didn't catch up last night. And now, oh, there we go. And then I had problems loading the site. But now I can give you the thumbs up. Even Stitcher, I don't know why they were slow. But in the morning, it came around and they, they caught up. Everybody should be 
good again, and I noticed it really killed our stats the last couple of days. We were only able to muster three or four hundred uh, of our usual downloads because people didn't know where to find the show. And as soon as it came back on, and I guess now everybody is catching up on podcasts that they missed, there was an immediate leap to 1,500 downloads yesterday once the problem was fixed. We're already up to 1,000 today, and we haven't even done the show. So everybody's catching up. That's great. You don't have to miss out. We were working hard to try and, well, eventually we started working hard to try and fix this problem. And the Libsyn, I don't know, big star for the, uh, gold star for the Libsyn tech support guy, uh, Adam, who found it in like 20 minutes and got back to me. So great. Now you can all catch up on what we were talking about a couple of days ago, which will give you context for what we're going to talk about today, which is what Greg Dworkin is here for now. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Good morning. So that's true. Uh, you will yeah. get context for what we're going to be talking about today. On the other hand, you get to check up about all our predictions and see how off they were. Right. We were wrong, possibly. <clears throat> I predict that I was wrong. And if it turns out I was right, I'm still batting 500. Yeah, well... Uh, just so you know, uh, this is from ABC News. Investigation into Lucky Charms okay, after more you. than 100 consumers claim the cereal made them sick. They haven't found anything yet. I see. But people are complaining about it. So uh, It uh, makes me sick. It's too sweet. You know, I like the, the, the first cereal. thing that one uh, thinks of is, okay, well, let's check it out because there are all these complaints. And then my second thought was, wait a minute, what is this? Are these the anti-magic, anti magic hmm. anti uh <laughs> you know, uh, uh, science yeah. fiction people oh, writing in did. because, uh, you know, it's it's not comporting to their idea yes. of uh, what uh, children's uh, uh, presentations ought to be. I mean, this is is this Teletubby stuff. I don't know. Ah, so we'll have the, to wait uh, and see. How. British unionists, because after all, it is magically delicious, as right. the phrase goes. And uh, it's made by General Mills, who I thought was currently serving in Ukraine yes. in the international well, he division. Was killed because uh, they kill all the generals there. Yeah, that's unfortunate apparently. for them. Well, okay. Uh, so a lot of people got sick from Lucky Charms. That's too bad. I mean, well, people are complaining that they felt oh. ill. Oh, okay. So well, uh, alleged. Me too. I complain. I feel ill. How about that? Where's my compensation? Anyway, that that's why the Lucky Charms. All right. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate knowing that I was. I, I didn't know whether there was some connection, but maybe there is the the idea of it uh, being, well, I feel sick or I have phantom symptoms. Maybe it is a Q thing. I think you get sick from alphabets if they still make that. Yeah, well, I don't know. So uh, you want to do domestic or Ukraine first? Mm, we'll do both. U but... Ukraine, sure. Ukraine. My Ukraine, Ukraine, we all yeah. crane. So uh, what's happening when and uh, if you heard the Monday show, we talked about this at length, and I was ranting about our newspapers of record not getting the uh, framing right. Washington Post actually did a very nice uh, job after that rant, uh, and everybody was talking about the imminent and now ongoing uh, Russian offensive. Hmm. But uh, again... They made it sound as if, oh, everything starts and the, and the big tanks and the armor roll out and such. And, and that's not really what's quite uh, happening. No. Uh, according to uh, the people who study this, okay. Philip O'Brien, Mark Hurtling, oh, right. uh, um, uh, Michael Kaufman and others, it is standard, uh, I don't know what you call it, policy, technique, uh -huh. uh, the way – that uh, Russia fights their wars is when they're ready to have an offensive, they mm -hmm. start with heavy artillery oh. okay. uh, to uh, frighten, scare, kill, yeah. maim, soften up, shape, as they say in military terms, the battlefield. That sounds like normal procedure from the yes, movies. Yes, yes. So that's or their doctrine. It's their doctrinal artillery. way to fight a war. Yeah. So according to the experts, what's really happening here isn't so much the beginning of the offensive. It is part of the offensive, of course. So technically it's correct that it's the beginning of the offensive. But what they're doing is shaping the battlefield and how long that lasts can be hours, days, weeks, months. Not clear. Okay. Uh, right. You're supposed right. to, uh, like? according to their preference. doctrine, what you do is you soften up the battlefield and then you have all these probing small attacks at the Ukrainian defensive lines. Right, your tires fall off. To see 
whether there's any weakness there or not. And if there's weakness, then you're supposed to go ahead and, and have a larger uh, thrust at the weak spots. And so here's the problems with this. Again, the, it, it isn't automatic that just because this is what they're doing and everybody knows that that's what they're doing, that it's going to work. And here's where fog of war does come in. It may be a transparent war in the sense of everybody sort of has an idea of what's going on. Russia needs to win the Battle of Donbass. This is the da battle for Donbass. But uh, let me give you a couple of threads about why this is important and unclear. Uh, this one is from a fellow who uh, calls himself used T-72 salesperson. <laughs> All right. I got a would you, would you buy a used tank from this? Man? <laughs> I think I have to if that's what I want. So he writes, as the battle for Donbass is unfolding, much has been said about the problems Russians might encounter with logistics, which we've talked about at length, uh -huh. equipment deficiencies, lack of motivation and reinforcements, et cetera, et cetera. I think we've covered all of that. But one aspect I want to emphasize is the challenge to the Russian command. First, here's a map to appreciate the sheer scale of the uh -oh. thing. Map. It involves at least four different axes of advance spread across two Russian military districts and now involves elements of at least four Russian armies two separatist corps, and a tank division. Uh -huh. Okay. And refers to uh, maps you can find all over the internet about sort of a um, reverse sea of land uh, that the uh, uh, Russians control in the south and southeastern portions of Ukraine. Uh -huh. Uh and uh, one analyst says the attacks so far appear to be methodical, rely heavily on ground-based fire. Battalion tactical groups or BTGs have reportedly massed in the Isium area for offensive operations. Remember, that's where Ukrainian counterattacks are taking place, cutting right. off supply lines. Overall, 76 know. BTGs in Donbas region and in the southeast, according to the U.S. Department of Defense. And before what we get we to the rest of the command control issues... Uh, let me just talk about the 76 BTG thing, because that's a number that you see flying around all the time. And the more astute analyst had said, you have to stop counting these. They're misleading. Okay. It makes it sound never, like each one of the BTGs anyway. is fully formed, hmm. fully staffed, fresh troops, supplied, ready to go. A lot of these are from the Battle of Kiev in the north, which they lost. And they're poorly constituted. Nobody really knows when you cite that this is a BTG, who's in it? Is uh, it 100 people or 1,000 people like it's supposed to be? Is it fresh troops or is it uh, spent troops? Is it uh, uh, PTSD troops? Hmm. Uh, is it uh, regulars? Inflated is it uh, 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 people from the uh, irregulars that are in the uh, breakaway regions? So uh, really unclear, in other words, what kind of fighting force it is. So just the numbers alone don't really tell you as much as they used to. Okay. Uh, so our used tank salesman fellow goes on to say, uh, the scale and the complexity is unseen since, well, World War II. Okay. In World War II, Operation Uranus featured – What? 11 Soviet armies, even though the headcount involved was an order of magnitude larger. And that was the counterattack that surrounded uh, the Nazis uh, in Stalingrad. That's what called it? Amazing. Okay. The Russian army has not ever yet. performed or trained for operations this large and complex. This is the important thing. The Georgia War was fought with just one army. The 2014 2015 Donbass operations were similar scale, if not smaller. And Russian exercises rarely involve more than one military district. There's two to four armies in a district. Vostok 2018, the largest exercise since the Cold War, pitched two military districts, Central and Eastern, against each other, but there was no multi-district coordination. That was never practiced. And typically, Russian exercises involve a strategic defense followed by a frontal counterattack, not large World War II-style encirclements that the Russians seem to be shooting for. Uh, shooting for nope. advisedly add to this many exercises are highly choreographed as many things are in the russian military the general who's currently in charge the butcher of syria general oh. uh Dvornikov, rumored to be russia's overall field commander doesn't have more experience with this than anybody else he's seen as successful in establishing army air naval interoperability in syria but he only ever had a local corps under his command and smarter people than me have wondered how Dvornik 
Kalev will structure his command. The options that he has is either overburdening the Southern Military District headquarters or creating a new command structure from scratch, which would require expensive communications. They don't have that. Right. And so if this whole thing was too long and you didn't read it, the Russian army is neither the experienced nor readily available capability of conducting a mega offensive as we've seen unfolding. And they may still pull it off, but this and other issues are going to translate into blunders and higher casualties. Hmm. So keep that in mind. Yes. Uh, well, you can overcome a lot of those problems by killing Sheer everybody number. else. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so that's where the heavy artillery uh, and uh, anti-artillery uh, weapons, the heavier stuff that uh, the U.S. Is, and others are trying to get uh, into Ukraine comes into play. So if you reinforce those uh, set uh, lines, and, and uh, Ukraine has been building these defenses since 2014. True, right. Uh, so if you reinforce those with uh, capabilities to uh, shoot further, uh, then you get to counterattack against some of the Russian artillery that's going on. So again... None of this is easy, even if you, quote, win, end quote, nobody really wins because there's going to be a lot of people killed. Uh, the Russians certainly have the capability to flatten cities. That's not the question. But the question is overall whether or not you get close to your objectives. Uh, we expect Mariupol to fall. We've expected it for weeks, but it really should be fairly soon because the defenders are running out of time uh, and the uh, artillery barrage is, isn't helping any. And that uh, helps prevent uh, reinforcement, food weapons, uh, 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 ammunition. Because after you shoot it, you don't have it anymore. So you got to replenish mm -hmm. logistics. Uh, so, uh, you know, that will be a Russian claim it's that, that uh, they have now taken the city after having said they've taken the city uh, multiple times. This time they probably have. Uh, and that still doesn't settle who wins the area. Mm -hmm. Right. Next piece is uh, Lawrence Friedman and talks about. What's going on with Putin? Do we and an interesting, you know, uh, 60,000 feet view of what's happening here. He says, it's 50 years since I read Hannah Arendt's essay on living, on lying in politics, not living in politics, lying in politics, oh. although it's the same thing for some people. Yes, of course. The essay was prompted by the unauthorized release of the Pentagon Papers, a classified documentary history of U.S. policymaking in the Vietnam War. What shocked many at the time was the evidence that while Lyndon Johnson's administration continued to tell the American people its strategy was working despite the accumulating casualties, top officials knew it was failing. And much mm. of the commentary surrounding the release of the papers, including Arendt's, turned on the role of deception and self-deception. One passage in the essay struck me and influenced my subsequent efforts to understand how political leaders end up making such poor choices about military power. And this is the passage. Oddly enough, she wrote, the only person likely to be an ideal victim of complete manipulation is the president of the United States. Oh. Because of the immensity of his job, he surrounds himself with advisors, the national security managers, as they've recently been called by Richard Barnett, who exercise their power chiefly by filtering the information that reaches the president and by interpreting the outside world for him. The president, one is tempted to argue, allegedly the most powerful man of the most powerful country, is the only person in this country whose range of choices can be predetermined. Hmm. And yeah. I recall that passage, Lawrence Friedman wrote, when considering how Putin came to decide on his calamitous war against Ukraine. The key insight was that someone so powerful could also be so badly informed. That was the case with Lyndon Johnson in the mid-60s. Could it also be the case for Putin in 2022? That's now. So as Johnson took the decisions that led the U.S. into the Vietnam quagmire, he was aware he might be getting drawn into an unwinnable conflict. Despite this, he was fearful that his domestic policy could be jeopardized if he lost another country to communism mm -hmm. and was persuaded by confident advisors that with a well-honed intervention, this could be avoided. And much of Arendt's essays devoted to a critique of the policy managers who formulated the options. These options always come in threes. Two outliers to be rejected and a third comfortably in the middle, offering the most desirable outcome as a man at a manageable cost. So the outcome was far more contingent than the supporting facts allowed, while the proposed action was apt to lead to alternative and far less desirable outcomes. And that's a familiar feature of all policy advocacy. Right. Well, you have three options, uh, right. boss. You can do it uh, that guy's way, which will get the country uh, or company destroyed. 
Right. Uh, you can do it this other way, uh, which is to do nothing, and that will mean everybody passes it. Or you can do it my way, which is a combination of the two, which is the sensible middle, Both which sides. will get you exactly uh, the policy that I've been advocating since the beginning. Mm-hmm. But it's your choice. Right. I'm not trying to influence you. <laughs> Uh, and what are you doing here? Stop cashing your checks. Right. But, Putin's okay. decision-making doesn't, however, appear to have been constrained by the options presented to him by his advisors. This war was his choice, and one he appears to have discussed with few advisors before his fateful decision. During the COVID years, Putin isolated himself from unnecessary human contact. He doesn't surf the internet. Right. He doesn't scan social media. He surrounds himself with courtiers and sycophants. Sounds like uh, the former guy. Mm-hmm. who reinforces worse instincts rather than challenge them. The frightening glimpse we were given into the workings of his security council a few days before the war as powerful figures in the Russian system checked themselves to make sure they were saying what the boss wanted them to hear confirmed this point. And so because so few were consulted, few had an opportunity to ask about the prospect versus success. Mm-hmm. Of course, it's his, 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 it's his responsibility to check. And this experts at hands who might have warned him but, of course, if you don't ask the questions, you're not going to get the answer. Right. Okay. Right? Well, only so, matters in the uh, system, maybe, though. There's a lot of things that go on to his thinking. And, uh, you know, we've been seeing a lot of this. Uh, it, it is remarkable, if you dig into it a little bit and talk to the Soviet experts, mm-hmm. how uh, prejudicial a lot of the talk about Ukrainians is. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, slurs about their uh, haircuts, Cossacks. Uh, haircuts? Are, wow. Yeah. I mean, the Cossacks had, <laughs> a, they had a, uh, a, 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 a kind mullet. of a braid, like a, mullet. A, a ponytail, except in the oh. front. Oh. And, and that hairstyle has Reverse become mullet. a Russian slur for Ukrainians. Okay. Commonly used. Hmm. And, uh, well, you know, you see it in, the, in literature, in poetry. You see it in... Uh, uh, reports of how Russian media sure. covers Ukraine even before this war. I saw it in uh, Trump's comments about Ukraine. He so it. it's, uh, you know, it's kind of ubiquitous. Hmm. And, uh, you know, there is this entire feeling in uh, Putin's world that uh, Ukraine truly doesn't deserve to exist as a country. We're offering them the ability to be Russian and speak Russian language. Sure. They're choosing their own primitive uh, language they deserve uh, to have their illusions of being a separate country when they're not taken away from them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, point being, understand. if that's sure. the frame that you're seeing the conflict, it's very difficult to stop fighting, short of complete victory. Right. Uh, why are you surrendering to those guys? Yeah. So, uh, you know, why hasn't Putin just uh, pulled back and given up? He can't. Mm-hmm. It, it isn't just that he's committed the troops. It isn't just that the right wing in uh, the old Soviet Union that he imagines uh, is uh, pushing him to continue and wouldn't accept him stopping. The whole mindset, the whole framing really doesn't allow it. So none of that is good news. Yeah. And if you're able to manipulate things such that uh, nobody knows what's going on or knows. And, the truth and no about other it, alternative views are, are acceptable. Right. So you right. It, it makes it easier, certainly. Right. Now, there's hmm. some stuff that's been a little bit exaggerated. Uh, uh, Friedman writes, the framing of the war as a continuation of the one fought against the Nazis explains the importance of Victory Day on 9 May. And everybody wow. said, well, Putin has to have a victory by May 9th. Well, if he doesn't, he'll just keep going until he gets one. So keep the, calendar the, on the date's 9th. important, but it's not uh, determinative in, in, in any sense. Mm-hmm. The Senate can. It's not dispositive. Okay. So he'd love to have another victory by May 9th. Is May so 9th maybe he'll maybe he'll of... he'll call Mary Paul that victory. I don't know. Mm, uh, yeah, that might line up. That might even get that done before May 9th. But uh, he he concludes, uh, Putin launched a war based on a narrative constructed out of potent symbols, deep seated grievances, historical myths, and claims about Ukraine that were falsified as soon as they were tested. And this was deception on a grand scale. But most of all, it was self deception. He was the one responsible for the narrative. He was the one most convinced by its potency, and he was ready and able to act on it. Mm-hmm. So to quote Arendt's essay again, lies are often much more plausible, more appealing to reason than reality, since the liar has the great advantage of knowing beforehand what the audience wishes or expects to hear. 
whereas reality has the disconcerting habit of confronting us with the unexpected for which we were not prepared. And if you think about Republican and Democratic campaigning, mm. that's it right there. Yeah, in many I mean, ways. We'll, we'll do with the domestic stuff afterwards, but, you know, uh, how come Trump is such a good liar? Because this is what his audience wants to hear, and he knows it, and so he gives it to him. Yeah. Well, why can't Biden just go and, and rile up Democrats the same way? Because we're not looking to hear the same lies. Mm. We don't want the Beach Boys' greatest hits. Wow. Well, I suppose if we would... Make up our minds which lies we wanted and tell them in advance. We we could get them, I suppose. But, yeah, it's the, the problem is, uh, one, we don't want all the same We want a anyway. science and reality and based two, on the yeah. Okay, well, that means you don't know what's coming next. Yeah. Well, because science Well, I didn't know. expect this. Well, see, that's what I told you. Hmm. Well, it's more comforting to think that you do know what's coming next. Hmm. Well, we'll see if we can... Work something out for you if you're that kind of person. But I, I think uh, we aren't. Not many of us, anyway. So, okay. Well, that's uh, <clears throat> disconcerting, to say the least. And uh, the fact that they keep having to compare everything to World War II, also not very helpful. But but it probably helps them domestically in Russia to portray this as a World War II style campaign against uh, those Ukrainian Nazis again. So it all fits for them. Why are we having – that might be interesting. Eventually they have to explain the difficulty if that's the case, if they actually have to explain themselves at any point. They say, well, this is this is hard, just like World War II when we fought the Nazis. The new Nazis are no less difficult to defeat, as it turns out. We were hoping they would be, but they aren't. Uh, I wonder if that would fly for them. I guess anything they want would fly. So we'll keep an eye out to see what uh, – I guess whatever they announce is uh, their deepest seated fantasies brought to life. Uh, and I wonder whether all of this holds if you don't really feel like you're accountable to public opinion because you're a mafia organization as opposed to just an absolutist uh, government. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options, too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the K-Gordon Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Time to solve the other half of the problems in the world, I guess. Domestic issues. Uh, if it's 50, the world is 50% my problems and 50% uh, everything else. So... That's the way I view it, and uh, the first half hour is for well, everybody uh, else in the uh, world. Well, 50% my problems, and the other 50% are problems that are affecting me. Yeah, <laughs> they're your problems, but I heard about them. Your That's problems, the but issue. you're really yeah. annoyingly That's affecting really me it, with them, so it? I'm going to pay I attention mean, to them, too. There's problems in Africa I didn't hear about today. Yeah, South so uh, uh, CDC, uh, CDC uh, says that uh, somewhere in the beginning of May, uh, uh, yes, they were what? planning on getting rid of the uh, mass requirements on airlines and transportation. May 9th. And a federal today. judge who knows nothing about science other than uh, follows the miasma theory of illness. <laughs> we want this to uh, Said, oh, you can't, you don't have the authority to order masks. All you can do is sanitation. And right. masks aren't sanitation because they don't really clean anything. But they do. So uh, you can't use them. Yeah. And and uh, basically, <laughs> the uh, Biden administration mm -hmm. looked at this and said, this is outrageous. This won't stand. We will appeal it. If CDC decides after May 9th, they still need it. Uh -huh. 
So oh, if okay. it turns out that CDC decides they don't need it, and they probably will determine that they don't need it, then we won't appeal it because we don't need to. Well, I mean, it makes a certain amount of sense. But well, what makes more <laughs> sense is we don't want to appeal it. Yeah. Because if we appeal it, the Supreme Court will have the opportunity to say, you don't have the right, you agencies, to decide anything anymore. Yeah, maybe. And that's what they're worried about. Well, then the strategy works. Uh, not they, the, they could uh, say, okay, you don't want CDC to do it? FDA will do it. Or, uh, you know, we'll go back to something mm, we fought about for a long time and whether or not some of, uh, you know, occupational uh, health and safety can do it. So uh, there's other That's ways around idea, really. it, which would take a while. But the decisions are practical ones, which is to say, is it better to just leave it be and then save this for when we need it? Or do we want to go to the wall in this now and risk having a 6-3 Supreme Court, which doesn't really believe in precedent, uh, you know, yes. give them their opportunity to open the door to uh, defang federal agencies? Hmm. Uh, I like the other suggestion, which is a, a very Republican approach to it. You say, well, the order says uh, CDC can't do it, but what about CDB? What about CDD? You will come up with another agency and then make you go through the whole exercise again until you finally say no agency can yeah. do it. And then we'll say, well, we'll call it a bureau. Did we say CDC? We said TCB. Yeah. This is just taking care of business. Right. right. I mean, you know, they just yeah, come back with a business bureau version. will do it. It says right here it's taking care of business and they do business. So we'll right. let the BBB do it. Why not? I, that's, I think the way they would probably handle it. But OK, I see we're in for a real treat. Well, please don't. You know, do this to us. We won't go to the federal judiciary or we'll recognize that. I mean, to me, I guess why not play it one more uh, move ahead? If the fear is that if you appeal this facially ridiculous ruling and take it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will say, no, we love facially ridiculous things, then we would then get the message that, OK, the Supreme Court simply needs to be expanded, as we've been saying all along, and let's do it. But I fear that uh, I guess their fear is that we'll get there, discover that the court needs to be expanded and then they'll chicken out and they know that. So let's not go down that road. Oh, well. So uh, this one, uh, speaking domestically, is the Salt Lake Tribune. It's the editorial oh. board. Saturday's Utah State Republican Convention would be a great place for Mike Lee to come clean. Oh, well, I mean. Even if Lee abandoned the plot, which is to say to uh, uh, commit uh, treason and sedition, and I suppose it's more sedition than treason, but, you know, these are technical words. Mm -hmm. Even if Lee abandoned the plot as unworkable, he owes voters a full accounting. Confession, it is said, is good for the soul. It should also be good <laughs> politics. Well, it's not, and it won't it, be. Well, it's past time for Mike Lee to start fessing up that all he knows about the plot to set aside the results of an honest and fair election to keep Donald Trump in power. True. We know Utah's senior senator had a much greater role in that plot than he's previously acknowledged. His constituents yes. deserve a much more detailed accounting of what went on and the extent of Lee's participation in it. Yesterday would be a great time for Lee to come clean. Saturday <laughs> would be a good <laughs> opportunity, too. Yes. So, uh, Sunday you know. even. Uh, uh, then, then they go through, of course, uh, Lee is not innocent in this. He's no hero because at the end he decided that he got cold feet. That doesn't uh, absolve him. Okay. This is Amanda Carpenter in The Bulwark. Oh, yes. Mike Lee's role in Trump's attempted coup. What would have happened if his plan worked? Let's bat that argument around. The text show Lee was question. eager to assist Trump in challenging the election to the point of Lee texting Meadows dozens of times, begging, please tell me what I should be saying. Yes. And offering his advice about what should be done. Okay. Right. Specifically, the text and Lee's other on-the-record statements show he was consistent in advocating that the only way, according to the Constitution, to change the outcome was for state legislators to appoint alternate slates of electors for Congress to accept on January 6th. Lee spent much time and effort insisting on this, but the state legislators did not. So Lee didn't raise any objections and voted to certify Biden as president. And for this, Lee is supposed to be some kind of hero. Hmm. Slow clap. Yeah. Because what if GOP controlled state legislators in the swing states Biden won had decided to appoint Trump electors based on whatever Cheetos dust some drive by gang of cyber ninjas sniffed and got high on while seizing <laughs> Dominion voting machines? 
uh, or I don't know, maybe too many lucky charms. Well, as Lee wrote Meadows on January 3rd, everything changes, of course, if the swing states submit competing slates. Get that? Everything changes. If yes. state-level Republicans had been okay with overturning the election results, Lee was okay with it, too. Yeah, like Brad Raffensperger. Right. Same thing. Now, in interviews with Woodward and Costa for their book, Lee depicted himself as somebody who, through December 2020, never wavered from the view that Congress had no role in messing with Electoral College votes. The story goes that somebody directed him to speak with these men around Christmas time. Hawley and Cruz started looking at other options to change the election results. Lee didn't go along with their plans. And on January 2nd, in Woodward and Costa's book, Lee was shocked to receive a memo from Eastman. Yes. Now, it's conceivable Lee was shocked that Eastman wanted the president of the Senate, Mike Pence, to play a prominent role in January 6th. But the idea of alternate electors is one Lee knew plenty about. Because uh, that was in Eastman's memo. Because right. he and his friends have been talking about it quite a bit. And then she time. gives relevant tests to document that, in fact, that's what he was trying to do. Yes, right. Well, he knew that. And uh, we learned also very recently that Eastman has been at this for some 20 years. This has been a pet theory of his, it turns out. So. Right. So what's amazing is how desperately Lee was still trying to make Trump's dream of flipping the election come true as late as January 4th, 2021. We shouldn't. Ignore Lee's role in this, and hopefully the January 6th committee won't any more than we should ignore Jared Kushner's uh, corruption just because it's not in the news today. Mm -hmm. Does she name that? Uh, I'm no, but know. I'm okay. just saying, oh, just you know, okay. yeah, these, are, right. these are big stories that shouldn't go away just because say, she's uh, right. the editors right. at the New York Times and Washington Post decided that this shouldn't be front page news every day. Yeah, it's a very uh, interesting story and informative in case you were wondering, what does it cost to get away with chopping up the body of a Washington Post columnist. And the answer is billions. Yeah, two. Right. So uh, that's the New York price. Times, that's three billion. Right. So don't chop Just like we up. found out uh, what's the price for lying for Alex Jones. Right. True also. Always a price on it. At the event, Trump said, Mike Lee is here too, but I'm a little angry at him today. I just want Mike Lee to listen to this, what I'm talking about, because you know we need his vote. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's, that's at the January 6th his, event. Uh, I'm so sad text to uh, Mark Meadows. It's, uh, the, the first inkling Mike Lee got that if there's anything less than 100% loyalty, and maybe even 100% loyalty isn't enough, you will be stabbed in the back or possibly in, in the face by Donald Trump. I can't believe that it took him that long to figure that out. But it, and who knows? Maybe he still doesn't understand it. Well, you know, again, uh, the thesis here is Trump is irredeemable. Trump is Trump. Uh, but the people around him, uh, you know, be it Mike Lee or Bill mm -hmm. Barr, you know, uh, the so-called respectable people who still, uh, you know, have jobs or want jobs, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on, on boards or whatever. Uh, these are the people that are responsible for what Trump did far more than Trump. Yeah. All Trump could do is whine. These people, you know, operationalized is whining. <laughs> That's true. It's just a crazy guy whining without the backing of the people in suits who occupy the seats of power. I mean, true, Trump did occupy a seat of power in a suit. Um, but, yeah, I guess you, you hope for, I mean, when everybody uh, moaned and groaned about, oh, my God, what are we going to do with this clown as president? There were plenty of people who said, well, you know, uh, the presidency doesn't actually sort of run itself. The, the, their own version of the deep state theory is that the people around him will keep things competent and on the on the right path yeah but it turns out that they were worse it turns out they'll give him three options you know <laughs> right the one hillary clinton wants the one aoc wants or this one which really seems to be much more reasonable and right. what you wanted to hear all along which, is just... which one will you choose mr president i gave you the options uh, which one makes money or mm -hmm. which one can i steal? for you right <laughs> Yeah, so exactly. uh, this is in The Atlantic, Sarah Longwell writing, a right. conservative but longtime anti-Trumper. Trump supporters explain why they believe the big lie. For many of Trump's voters, the belief that the election was stolen isn't a fully formed thought. It's more of an attitude. Okay. Right? 35% so of really Americans. Again, it. it's not even close to a majority. Uh, but uh, it's in the same range as those who thought Nixon shouldn't have resigned after Watergate. That was in the 23, 25 percent, but same ballpark, same 35 percent 
uh, some 35 percent of Americans, including 68 percent of Republicans. Again, not 100. It's yeah. the 30 percent you want to talk to, not these 68 percent. You don't want to waste time with them. They believe the big lie pushed relentlessly by former Donald Trump. I regularly host focus groups to better understand how voters are thinking. And for many of Trump's voters, the belief that the election was stolen is a attitude, a tribal pose. They know something nefarious occurred, but they can't explain how or why. What's more, they're mystified and sometimes angry that other people don't feel the same. I can't really put my finger on it, said a woman from Wisconsin. Something just doesn't feel right. A man from Arizona said it didn't smell right. Mm -hmm. A man from Pennsylvania said something about it didn't seem right. Yeah, well, guess what I think about you. The things that aren't right, the, the details vary. They don't matter. OK, and this is maybe because the big lie has been part of the background noise for years, started back in 2016. Mm-hmm. And uh, some Trump voters looked at the numbers, couldn't make sense to them. Everybody talked about the red wave that was going to happen until the uh, write in votes uh, or the uh, absentee ballots. Oh, yes. Rather, right. were counted. Everybody said that. Everybody said that. Nobody listened. So how could it be we were leading when we went to bed and then we woke up and he was losing? Obviously, something happened. Yes, other people voted. Very common refrain. The votes flipped in the middle of election night. Uh, uh, part of the problem is, of course, uh, we just don't administer elections terribly efficiently. Mm. That was never the issue before. What we wanted to do is get it right. We didn't care whether it was efficient, but apparently doing it efficiently in this day and age matters. Uh, yes. I guess right. if you tell Trump people correctly that. assumed that the majority of the mail in ballots that would be counted late night would go to Biden. So he cast mail in ballots as fraudulent almost by definition. The woman from Georgia told me mail in ballots were a crock without elaborating further and attempts to set the record straight tend to backfire. When you tell Trump voters the election wasn't stolen, uh, some of them use that as evidence that it was stolen. I didn't believe it was stolen until you guys started to tell me it was. These voters aren't bad or unintelligent people. The problem is the big lies embedded in their daily life. They hear it from politicians, peers, MAGA-friendly media outlets, and from these sources, they hear the same false claims repeated ad infinitum. So now we're at the point where to be a Republican means to believe the big lie. This is the important part of the story, not feeling empathy for Trump voters. But as long as Republicans leading the party keep promoting and indulging the big lie, that'll continue to be the case. And so... uh, You know, this is a chicken and egg thing, you might say. But as long as you have uh, politicians like Abbott and DeSantis who are, you know, leading the pack for uh, next presidential election uh, who do and say nasty things every single day and get in the news about it every single day, that's going to be part and parcel of, quote, what Republicans think, end quote. So, yeah, it is a waste of time arguing or even trying to reach people in this particular category. But again, a reminder, uh, they're interesting, but they're not a majority. Right. They're a majority of Republicans, unfortunately, but yeah. they're not a majority of the United States. Give them lucky charms, I say. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it'd be okay not to cover Trump diner uh, chats every single day. That'd be fine. Uh, but it is interesting every once in a while to take a look over time and see if things are changing. And if you go from 80 to 68 percent, that's a change. It's interesting. It's worth noting. Hmm. Uh, It's not worth uh, dwelling over. I guess that's true. Okay. Uh, Here's Robert Costa uh, talking about a looming question for January 6th committee. Who will agree to publicly testify? A conservative who offers details in context? One option is Judge Ludig. Hmm. Okay. Who assisted Pence with the vice president's letter. Uh which is, I guess, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. President, I can't do what you want. If invited by the Congress, I would, of course, be glad to testify. Okay. He actually knows some stuff. If he was helping Pence prepare the don't hang me, I'm just doing my job. Mm, Yeah. Letter. So he'd be an interesting person to hear. You mean on TV? like Yeah, uh, Yeah, exactly. Televised hearings? Okay. Yes, exactly. Because they know. Because this is the persuasion part of trying to reach the uh, uh, 32% who aren't. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, they're watching OAN, but yeah, yeah, they are you. for now. But, uh, you know, the question is what happens, uh, when you have the televised hearings, which are going to get a lot of attention. Yes. These are the kind of folks you want there. Look, I'm a conservative. I was there. Here's what happened. These are just the facts. Hmm. And somebody like that would be, uh, you know, very good to testify. Yeah, maybe. I mean, why not? 
get the truth. Well, don't don't platform idiocy, lies, or wastes of time. I guess so. <laughs> Why not put Ludwig on there? And then there was this part of Clockwork Orange, which I saw, which might help us with these guys. It, but it looks very painful, but possibly could work. But in the meantime, yeah. They, if what can you do if they don't watch? That's okay. It's not really for them necessarily, as you say. It's for the others who might be somehow persuadable or at the very least it's for everybody else who will understand it and then they will understand well, these other people are bad people they, that's the part we disagree with with the atlantic uh well, you got your numbers right but they are bad people and they should feel bad about how bad they are and uh, we'll make them feel bad right it's an interesting uh by beating uh, them at the polls i don't peace don't uh, uh, this is uh from the wall street journal and uh, Karen uh, Bates uh, tweets this. Remember when Tennessee probably don't because I guess the governor isn't oh, running we'll for president. See. But do you remember uh, when Tennessee was the first state to pass a law attempting to limit what teachers could teach about race? I don't believe I do remember that they were, but OK. Not particularly Not prominent surprising. again, because their governor wasn't trying to run for president, oh. which is why you hear it about it uh, in places like Texas and, uh, and Florida. Who is their governor? Is that Bill Lee? Is that yeah? Them? OK. Right. Yeah, who's not uh, Brian Kemp? Funny. Only one complaint Bill over Lee. teaching has been filed with any school district statewide under the new law. <laughs> then Tennesseans don't even remember when Tennessee was the first. Right. Great. Right. Good. They probably remember the Scopes trial though. Yeah, maybe. Can't believe we lost that. Mm. All right. Well, these laws continue to feel significantly more steep in political signaling by elected leaders than what's actually happening in schools, making the same point I made. These mm -hmm. culture wars are such a distraction. Please take a minute to read Nat Wixler to understand the work in Tennessee that should compel attention. OK. Mm. All right. Uh, and this is in Forbes. Beyond Mouse, M-A-U-S, how Tennessee schools are uh, changing for the better. Is that the first? So I think that oh. was the mouse. Oh, yes. Thing. Yes. There we go. What did, was that? Yeah. OK. I remember that now. That I do remember. That. Thank you. Thank you for putting that back in context. Mouse. I remember that now that they flipped out first. Although I did think that that was Texas. Eh, T. School board in Tennessee Who County uh, voted unanimously to remove Mouse from its eighth grade curriculum, a yes. right wing parent group, and another challenged 31 books used in the elementary grades. Journalists and the general public tend to focus on conflict and drama. And for those who lean left, as I do, it can be natural to react to events like those in Tennessee with outrage. But heaping scorn on people who view the world differently rarely leads to positive change. However, I'm going to do with it. each op ed from another coastal public. Uh, publication, Tennessee becomes more alienated and our public officials dig their heels in deeper, observed one McMinn County resident who viewed the removal of mouse with dismay. Mm, so but there's more good stuff happening in Tennessee classrooms and news reports have led you to believe in a quiet revolution. Districts throughout the state have been revamping their approach to literacy instruction to ensure it works for all students, not those who would fr not just those who would thrive no matter what. Mm. And so they're talking about, in general, just improving the teaching that they do. So that sounds good. So I think I should keep yelling at the terrible people of Tennessee. Yeah, well. And the good ones will start quietly having revolutions. Just a reminder. You know, okay. the other reminder, of course, is that there's always blue people in red states, so don't yell at states. Uh, right. I'm yelling at the, the bad, bad school board people. Get rid of them. Go to the polls and get rid of them. Mm -hmm. I hope you'll be able to. So, uh... That's pretty much the uh, roundup about what's going on. All right. I think, uh, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, as transparent as the war in Ukraine is, we're now at the stage where we sort of know what's going on. Russia's doing the shaping of the battlefield with artillery, but we don't really know what's going on because we don't know what kind of forces uh, Russia is able to bring to bear mm. because on paper they look strong and in reality – they're weaker than that. We just don't know how much weaker, and that's really a key thing. And we know almost nothing about the Ukrainian side. Hmm. And so for those reasons, uh, we do know that the Ukrainians have been getting resupplied by the West, and we don't know uh, to what extent that has uh, that is going to help them right now and uh, and what they're going to do with the uh, information, and uh, which we're also providing but not talking about. There's talk that they're getting plane parts. Maybe they're getting planes. Maybe they're not. They deny they're getting planes, but we don't know everything that they're getting, and we don't expect them to tell us everything because to tell us is to tell the Russians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, 
you know. All right. I, uh, take everything you hear with a grain of salt, but at the same time, don't assume that the framing of the of the media is the right frame. That's the salt. That that's where the experts come in. All right. Well, we'll continue to keep an eye on it. What happens if I wonder if they just depart from war fighting doctrine entirely? What if they just keep shelling and just say, let's not actually launch the offensive. We'll just shell until everybody moves out of this area. Like we're not even going to push. Well, them. if we'll you can't, I mean, you know, in, in uh, Mariupol, for example, yeah. they're surrounded. Right. And so if there's no way to go, until or dead. if you start to do civilian uh, evacuation, and that's the place that Russia decides it's easiest and best to shell, because yes. they don't fight back, so do. and we want to intimidate them, then, uh, you know, just leaving isn't necessarily the best idea. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Well, we'll see whether uh, any of this follows regular war fighting doctrine. It might not in the end. Mm -hmm. but, uh, anyway, okay. that's it for today. Uh, we'll try to collect stuff between bad. now and tomorrow. Chances are stuff will happen. Uh, but, uh, again, the, uh, the uh, public January 6th committee presentations. Yes. Are getting Starting closer every day. So May 9th. Keep that in the back of your mind. <laughs> Everything's going to be May 9th, I think. We should do yeah, that. Yeah, we to, should do that. To troll Putin somehow. Is May 9th the anniversary of something big in the Soviet Union? Is that what it is? Oh, I don't know. They're or probably just, uh, when they declared victory in Stalingrad. Right. I'm, I'm just curious whether there's a, a, a... I don't know. I'm sure we could look it up. It's not on the NAFTA calendar, though. I won't be able to tell. So uh, maybe uh, Wikipedia... Uh, it's probably the uh, 23rd day of Passover. <laughs> All right. It's, 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 we're counting the Omer still at that point. Okay. On what? May 9th, 1945. Mm. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, let's see. Mm, nothing. It's a terrible day. German armed forces surrendered unconditionally hey. in the West on May 7th and in the East oh. on May 9th. There we go. Okay. So May 9th is their V-E So that was day. German surrender day. Yeah. Okay. April 30th, 1945 Eastern Orthodox was suicide day. Oh. Berlin fell to the Soviets between the 30th and the 7th. Mm -hmm. German armed forces surrendered unconditionally to the West on May 7th and in the East on May 9th. So that's why May 9th is Victory Day. Gotcha. And uh, since uh, Putin claims he's fighting Nazis, he right. wanted to make a big deal of May that's 9th. He's not going to get what he wants, like but that. that's okay if he doesn't get what he wants. Uh, our job at this point is to make sure he doesn't get what he wants. Right. Well, okay. Yeah, I was just wondering. I'm sure it was. It, it would come down to something like that. There had to be some symbolism, and it was probably grand and uh, that's pretty grand, I'm sure. I like the fact that they surrendered at a different date in the East so that we can joke about it as Eastern Orthodox VE Day. Right, exactly. They knew they were setting me up, uh, what, how many years later? 70-something years later. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, that makes some sense, I guess, for him. And he can, I, in that country, you can just declare it. We didn't have a victory. We did. The news says so. You all believe it, and if it's just wink, wink, that's good enough for me. And if you really don't believe it, we'll arrest you. Right. By the way, there's been a slew of polls in France showing Macron still has an 11-point lead. Oh, good. Uh, but today, Wednesday, I think is the day of the debate, the only debate. Hmm. Well, let's. They're debating whether so, to go forward. So basically, the thinking in France is Macron wins if the if his voters show up. If everybody's voters they? show up, he wins. Uh, right. Le Pen's uh, voters are definitely going to show up because they tend to be uh, very committed and most oh. of them need to be committed, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, uh, although I don't win. think there are enough institutions to commit them to. And uh, them throughout the, Europe, now. The, you know, Mélenchon is is uh, the third place guy uh, right. leftist uh, whose voters probably hold the key to uh, Macron's victory. Mélenchon wants to be prime minister. But he's not talking about it in terms of you need to uh, appoint me prime minister so that uh, we can mm -hmm. uh, together defeat, defeat Le Pen. He's talking defeat. about in the uh, upcoming legislative elections, you have to vote for my party. So I have the strongest party. Hmm. OK, well, I mean, so the maneuvering behind the simple. scenes is probably pretty significant and that uh, we're not hearing about that uh, today. I think the eyes are on the debate. All right, everyone watch. I won't. Uh, I wouldn't watch even if I understood French. And I'm sure they'll translate it for me, but I don't like the debates. But anyway, maybe they'll well, we'll talk Catholic about it tomorrow because yeah. uh, hopefully we'll have some things to say about it tomorrow. Yeah, okay. You watch. watch I just like an 11 point watch. lead better than an 11 point trail. 
Uh, sure, right. Everyone will take that. And uh, if you are in France and are French, please vote. And uh, <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm saying. You probably speak English certainly better than I speak French. Uh, so do that. The, well, the benefit the of it is you're in, in France. France. will probably vote two or three times. <laughs> that could be. They Once there and twice that. in the villages. Uh, les villages, I guess. I don't know how you say it, but I'm making it up. But uh, good luck, France. And uh, when do they start voting? Do they, uh, do well, they have early I, voting? I think the election Saturday. Oh, okay. So they probably don't even bother with early voting. They just do it all in one day. Who knows? Uh, that I don't know. We I we can ask, ask our, our French expert, uh, uh, who's one of the posters on Daily Coast, and, and oh, I'll ask him. Okay. Since sure. he lives there. Uh, yes, and tell him to vote. He's probably all right. And if there is early voting, he's probably already done it. Yeah. That's how we will answer the question. Okay, good luck to the French and to those debating and to those watching. And I don't know what else to say uh, for them. Okay, well, we'll wrap up again tomorrow. And, uh, yeah, the uh, this has given me a couple of ideas for directions. I guess your Tennessee thread reminds me that there's more nonsense going on in Florida. We'll wrap that up, and it, it appears... Uh, that um, uh, Ron DeSantis there once again ready to sacrifice all of his troops for a rhetorical victory and will shoot Florida in both feet in order to score big points against Disney and Mickey Mouse. It'll be so right. exciting. So that's the thing, you know, no matter how uh, comprehensively I try to cover the first hour, there's like a ton of stuff for you in the second hour. Yeah. well, that's It's just too much happening in this country. Up. I say slow it down. Right. Or like Bugs Bunny, saw part of it off and set it adrift in the sea. Mm. Not a bad idea. Okay. All righty. Take Thanks, care, Greg. and I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right. That'll be a good plan. We'll go along with that one. And, uh, yes, we've got to take our one-minute top-of-the-hour break, uh, well, in about half a minute. Now the music begins, warning us that we have half a minute until the one-minute break. But, yeah, today, I believe, activity in the Florida State Legislature where Ron DeSantis is preparing to deliver, or hoping to deliver on his threat, to punish Disney for a thing, which no one even knows exactly what it is. I think when they came out in opposition to his Don't Say Gay bill, uh, right, and that kicked off the whole groomer accusation craze, which is sweeping the nation. All right, welcome back now to the Gay in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue with, uh, well, I teased you on the other side, with the uh, idea that there was news from Florida. Well, there isn't. Ha <laughs> ha, suckers. No, uh, there is, of course, and I picked this tweet up yesterday. Uh, figured this would be an interesting development, something to keep an eye on today. Mary Ellen Klaas, K-L-A-S, uh, who tweets under the bizarre name of Mary Ellen Klaas, in case you want to find her. And and she does that, which is a real name, because she is the Miami Herald Capital Bureau Chief. And so she would be in a position to uh, know this and watch it happen. Details emerge, she tweets last night, on Ron DeSantis, Governor Ron DeSantis's idea to repeal Disney's special district, uh, or rather special district governing authority, basically to get rid of all of the special treatment that Disney gets in Florida because they are a major employer and lots of money changes hands and it's important that they prosper beyond all, you know, reason, essentially. And so they threw all sorts of great benefits at them. Now they want to repeal all those benefits because... Ron DeSantis and the Florida Republicans, in fact, national Republicans, feel ill-served by all the money they gave, and I guess they are, ill-served by all the money that they gave to Disney because Disney didn't back them all the way through to the end on their don't say gay bill. They backed them up front on it, and they contributed to all of the sponsors, the legislative sponsors of the don't say gay bill, and gave all the Republicans in the legislature lots of money and uh, I, I think comparatively little to the Democrats there, but I'm not positive that that's the case. But at any rate, they gave plenty of money to the people who started this business and then they realized when all of their employees said, uh, you suck and we'll all quit or at least we'll protest you uh, or we'll do both. We'll quit and then we'll, pro or we'll protest and you'll fire us and then we'll go outside and protest. Uh, 
but that basically uh, alerted them to just what was going on with this thing. And Disney, you know, I think the right thing to do there was for them to switch positions. Uh, I'm glad that they did, although it was a little bit late. But anyway, they switched positions, said, please don't pass this thing or let us re- let's have this thing repealed. Um, we oppose this legislation. And DeSantis took umbrage at that, I think. I don't know whether he really deep down actually did or not, but it's a good political ploy in his mind to play the outraged victim while he runs for president. This is appears to be his formula. He inserts himself in every controversy that reaches national social media attention. And it appears to me, this is relevant to another national story today that a lot of people are talking about, but I'll get around to the Florida details in a second, but I might as well make this connection. It appears to me that Ron DeSantis is, I guess, communications director, chief spokesperson, uh, is herself a social media presence. No surprise there. This is very much the Donald Trump model. And uh, she essentially is a, a right-wing troll and uh, crap poster that we would say that in this censored, uh, you know, the radio-friendly way of saying things, even though it's not radio. Um, and uh, you, you, so you get an idea of what story this is leading to later. But basically, she advises him and he accepts the advice that they should be, you know, insinuating him into every culture war thing that they can. And by the way, yes, uh, I used the term um, despite the fact that I'm advised that we should probably be looking for another term for culture war because it suggests a false equivalence that isn't really there, that uh, that there are two equal sides that's in fighting a legitimate war over these things when that's not actually the case. So that's true. We could probably examine some writing on that front at some point in the future. Uh, but I think, the, I think the argument needs to be developed a little bit better and uh, maybe present some alternative terminology for us to move forward with. Anyway, what's happening here, of course, is Disney reversed itself on the don't say gay bill and DeSantis decided he wants to punish them. It doesn't make any particular sense. It probably won't move them on the politics of it, but... It doesn't matter. It's another grievance thing. We once again have been victimized. And even if we can't really describe what the victim uh, victimization was about or what the, the problem really was here, it doesn't matter. The point is we uh, point at a common enemy and the troops react to it. And that's all there is to it. So here he is with a bill to punish Disney. And Mary Ellen Kloss reports as details emerge on what this idea is, legislatively speaking. The problem is that in repealing Disney's special tax treatment, that's a broad umbrella term for a lot of things that Disney got to do that ordinarily businesses don't get to do, special breaks, special arrangements, etc. And the special district governing authority, that Disney is essentially a mini municipal government unto itself. Their physical presence in the Orlando area, their footprint is big enough that it is essentially equivalent to, you know, the size and scope of running a small municipality or medium sized municipality. Oh, what do they employ? Like 70,000 people there. They occupy this huge swath of land. So it kind of almost makes sense, except when it strikes you that this is a private company and an entertainment company at that. They make they, they used to make cartoons and now they have a government. What is this? But money is green whether you're making cartoons or or not. And I guess if you have enough of it, uh, you know, if you can pay $2 billion for the right to chop up a journalist, you can certainly figure out a way to have a Mickey Mouse police force. Anyway, the point is that in punishing Disney by repealing all of this stuff, This stuff is intricate and tricky enough such that, you'll never believe this, Ron DeSantis might not fully understand exactly what's going on. Hard to tell. You know, it's it's rumored that he's actually perhaps a bright guy under all this, but he's playing the reactionary dummy because it'll make him president. And I don't know whether he plans to be a reactionary dummy president or is going to surprise us all with his brilliance at some point. But... 
Either way, I don't really want to find out. Um, uh, so it may be that he's just playing the fool in all this, but uh, whatever it is, uh, maybe he'll go ahead with this anyway. So in repealing all this stuff, one of the dumb things that will occur is apparently Disney at some point, along with its special district governing authority or pursuant to this authority, floated a $2 billion bond in Florida. I don't know if it was on the ballot or I don't know how you do these things. If you are, I, you know, I, I have some inkling of how a local government does it. I have no idea how an amusement park does it, but okay. Amusement park posing as a, as a municipality. Anyway, they floated $2 billion worth of bond debt, which, you know, at least in this part works the way you would think Disney owes $2 billion plus interest to whoever it is that buys these bonds. Apparently, though, in uh, wholesale repealing all the special treatment for Disney, the $2 billion bond debt transfers to Orange and Osceola counties, where I guess the physical presence of the Disney plant is. And Disney gets to skate somehow on the debt. I don't know how it works exactly, but that's the report. In other words, they borrowed $2 billion from the public and then Ron DeSantis in his fit of peak says, I'll punish Disney by allowing them to escape liability for the $2 billion and instead transfer the $2 billion debt to Orange and Osceola counties where the taxpaying families and hardworking Americans instead will have to assume the debt. Apparently uh, among the two counties, Every family, every tax-paying household in the two counties would be responsible for an assessment of $2,200 on top of their regular tax bill when this happens. So, you know, maybe you don't want to do this. This, according to uh, Senator, State Senator Gary Farmer of the uh, Florida State Legislature, uh, who then comments, I think quite aptly, this is shoot first and ask questions later, right? We're just going to, we're going to stick it to Disney. We're going to, I'll show you, we'll repeal your special treatment. Unforeseen consequence, $2,200 per family direct tax to two of the most populous counties, I guess, in Florida. I'm guessing. Orange County seems like a pretty big one. I don't know how Osceola is doing, but Floridians can tell me whether that's not the case. Mary Ellen then continues with a comment from State Senator Jeff Brandes, Brandes, B-R-A-N-D-E-S, uh, who asks, my concern is, is the bill, uh, or my concern is the bill essentially wipes away Disney's $2 billion of debt. If the legislative intent here is ultimately to attack them, then why would we want to cancel $2 billion of debt? That's a good question. And I'm sure they could work their way around it. I almost wish that they hadn't said anything so that they, we could all watch them shoot themselves in the foot and clown themselves, except that, you know, the poor people in uh, Orange and Osceola County will end up having to assume the bill. Anyway, uh, what else here? Senator Jen... Jennifer Bradley, uh, also quoted by Mary Ellen here, who says that the debt will be transferred to the general purpose government if the Disney special governance district is repealed, which will likely be the county. I suppose they could move it to the state and ask all taxpayers, and then at least the assessment would be lower, ask if the 1.7 million residents of Orange and Osceola should be asked if they want to assume the debt. She avoided an answer, which makes me think, like, maybe, is that a Republican person? Senator Jen Bradley doesn't say uh, in her bio, but it does say that she's a Florida State Senator for District 5 representing rural North Florida. And so, you know, if you had to guess based on that, would you guess Republican? So basically... So let me ask you the question. You're going to vote for this thing and punish Disney. Should we ask at any point whether the residents of the two counties will be stuck with the bill want that? No answer. That sounds kind of Floridian. Well, uh, Senator Farmer pressed her, apparently, 
Where in this bill, which applies to Disney and five other districts, does it say that these six districts, I guess there's other people with these districts, that these six districts don't serve a public purpose? I'm not certain where that's going. Jen Bradley concedes there's nothing that says they don't serve a public purpose. Again, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly where that's headed, but okay. We have grown to understand some of the powers of these special districts, and they can be quite sweeping, Jen Bradley says. I guess that's supposed to be, yeah, that makes me think she's a Republican um, working in favor of the bill, but unable to answer any of the Democratic questions about how this would even achieve the goal that they say they want. Uh, they shouldn't want it. They might not really want it. They can't explain what's really going to happen, though. And the question <clears throat> that they're asking here is, can you reconcile what will actually happen if you, quote unquote, punish Disney this way with the real world effects? I mean, have you actually read any of the legislation setting this thing up or repealing it? And do you understand the dynamics of it? And the answer is no, and they don't care. And that leads us perhaps to another larger overarching story uh, that I mentioned earlier. But uh, like in stories we discussed in the last day or so, like the, well, also in Florida, the ruling from uh, the newly minted Trump federal judge who invalidated the mask mandate uh, to DeSantis playing dumb here, to DeSantis's press person playing the crap poster and dealing with the other story that we haven't yet uh, told, but I think you know where I'm going with that one. It's the libs of TikTok story. Uh, some, the overarching theme, I think, that maybe helps explain all of these things, how could the Republicans be so dumb slash hypocritical slash whatever it is when you are actually an intelligent person and maybe went to perhaps a Ivy League school and actually are a fairly, you know, fairly intelligent and fairly smart person who can reason these things out. How do you come to the point where you are willing to play the dummy in order to win? Like, doesn't that embarrass you? Or don't you hate when you get called out as a hypocrite and it's totally obvious to everyone? Maybe as it happens in Tennessee, right? You know, with Tennessee doing these things and accusing everyone now, uh, joining in on the bandwagon of accusing everyone else of being uh, pedophiles and groomers, and then it turns out that they're all marrying 15-year-olds or whatever. Uh, doesn't that bother you? And wouldn't that be a hindrance to you in life in general? And I think we're missing something here that they just don't care and that part of the plan appears to be to confound liberals. I owned you. I pwned you, as they say. I'm, I, are you triggered by the fact that I am openly hypocritical or as we would say, openly gimitarian and it doesn't matter to me that this is inconsistent. Logic won't sway me. I'm reminded of it actually, this connection, because I see that uh, as I'm scrolling down uh, in the Mary Ellen Kloss thread here, the next thing that comes up and I don't know, am I, am I in her tweet thread or am I just looking at, the general Twitter feed now that the thread is over. But I, I, I happen to see the one of the various retweets of a floor speech given where are we here? Is this was this in Michigan? I can't recall who's uh, uh I'll have to look it up. Who's uh yeah, Michigan. In Michigan, a one of the state senators in Michigan Mallory McMorrow, I guess, is tweeting around her own speech here, although other people were tweeting around. Very uh, powerful floor speech because, as she says here in her tweet, Senator Lana Thies, T-H-E-I-S, accused me by name of grooming and sexualizing children in an attempt to marginalize me for standing up against her marginalizing the LGBTQ community in a fundraising email for herself, by the way, is where that happened. Hate wins when people like me stand by and let it happen. I won't. She gives a very powerful four and a half, four and almost five minute floor speech repudiating the position that this other senator has taken and calling her out for calling 
Senator McMurrow out by name and just making those wild accusations as is now the hottest thing to do in politics. And she really grills her and it's a great speech. And I'm sad already. I'm saddened actually to have watched it from yesterday, not only because, well, it's a good speech and it does all the right things and everybody, I'm watching everybody tweet around, this is how you do it. You know, you stand up for yourself. And that's true. If only logic worked, if only logic could win the day, then we would sweep them away with every. I'm sure they think the same thing in reverse, but they're wrong and we're right. I'm pretty sure about that one, actually. And uh, but but here I'm also pretty sure that uh, the fantastic speech doesn't dissuade them. Look, she's raking in dollars for her BS and she's not going to stop. She may or may not be intelligent enough to understand that she's been uh logically owned here by Senator McMurrow. And she may or may not care that liberals are tweeting around this fantastic speech footage to one another and, you know, giving themselves a moral victory. But she may be trading it for the dollars and not caring very much. I don't really care. I'm probably not going to lose my reelection. I definitely have less chance of losing my reelection now that I have all this money. Uh, and I can even possibly steal all this money if I do lose my election. So do I care that the uh, undeniable logic is that I'm a jerk and a bad person and a liar and I've been caught at it? And the answer is no, they don't. Similarly, the answer is no, they don't care that the uh, hypocrisy is that they'll be destroying 70,000 jobs at one of the largest employers in Florida if they repeal the tax district. And no, they don't care that every family in these two counties, Osceola and Orange County, Florida, would be stuck with $2,200 in extra taxes for their quote-unquote punishment of Disney. And they don't care that the entire sensible world will say, look what they did. They actually gave Disney, one of the biggest corporations in the world, a $2 billion free pass on debt they, that they stole from out of the public treasury, essentially. They don't care. They don't care that this judge or the judge doesn't care that down in Florida that her ridiculous ruling on the mask mandates is upside down, backwards, totally stupid, out of the dictionary. Sanitation means cleaning things, not making things or keeping things clean. It makes no sense. But she don't care. She's doing what she wants. She and her husband are cashing in. She's got a lifetime appointment. She just wants to win. They're all gimmitarians, and it's not going to bother them, ever. Let me jump over to, just to by way of, um, of uh, filling in some of the blanks here, before I get to the other, well, maybe we'll make the last segment about the libs of TikTok thing. I don't have that much to tell, tell you from my point of view about it, now that I've illustrated these what I think is this connective tissue between these things. But let me jump back again. Ian Milheiser provides us over at Vox with uh, his own more ordered, I guess. He sat down and spent time writing it out and organizing thoughts about why the mask mandate decision was so dumb. We winged it yesterday. I think we hit all the highlights, but probably some extra by organizing his thoughts. The Trump judge's opinion striking down the airplane mask mandate is a legal disaster. And I think Greg really added something to the the size and scope of the legal disaster by reminding us that we might have to sit or we might be asked to sit on our hands while the Biden administration says this horrific miscarriage of justice will just have to stand because if we appeal it, we will get another even bigger miscarriage of justice from the Supreme Court. Well, then why don't you do something about the Supreme Court? Well, we don't think that's going to work either. And they're probably right, because if they actually said the thing to do is to expand the Supreme Court, you would find once again, you've had like a couple of weeks off from this complaint, but you would once again be back in now because Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema say they don't want it. Yeah, that's unfortunately true. Oh, that reminds me of another story. Dang, there's too much to tell you. All right. I'm committed to Ian Milheiser for the moment. This decision, the subheader reads, is what happens when judges don't care what the law actually says. And again, I'm jumping out ahead of Ian Milheiser in the predictions game. He also has been, I think, on the warpath. I think we may even have quoted him on it. On the shadow docket stuff saying eventually the, the shadow docket, that the, that's just going to become routine and the conservatives are going to use it to do the gimmitarian things that they want without having to explain themselves. 
I jump out ahead there by saying eventually they're going to do that with the regular merits docket too. They'll just find that certain cases are uncomfortable, but they want the outcome and they just won't write opinions. I believe that's where we're going. Anyway, uh, and I guess if you're going to keep uh, nominating children as judges and then like everyone was joking yesterday, that they're going to turn this Florida judge into the next Republican Supreme Court nominee, then why would you change? I've now reached the apex of my profession. All I got to do is look like a dummy, but secretly know that I'm only kidding and I'm trading it for a Supreme Court seat. And then you get it and then you're proud of yourself and no one can make you feel ashamed. Ian, sorry, here we go. So you've probably heard by now that Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell, a Trump appointed judge in Florida, issued a sweeping opinion striking down the Biden administration's requirement that passengers wear masks on airplanes, trains and similar methods of transportation. This requirement from the Centers of Disease Control, uh, well, CDC, I don't want to do the whole name on these guys, provided that a person must wear a mask while boarding, disembarking and traveling on any conveyance into or within the United States, although it contained a few exceptions. For the moment, it's not in effect, as the Biden administration weighs whether to appeal the judge's order. Hours after the decision, the, count, the country's four largest airlines dropped their mask requirements, sometimes in mid-flight, which was quite annoying and stupid, and they really didn't have to do that. Mizell is the apothesis of former President Donald Trump's approach to selecting federal judges. Okay, appointed to the bench at age 33, Mizell was fresh off a clerkship for Justice Clarence Thomas and working as an associate at Jones Day, a large law firm closely associated with Trump. Hmm. When It's large enough that uh, eventually you're going to run into people associated with Trump, but it's got a lot. Anyway, it's a huge firm. When she received her lifetime appointment to the federal bench. At the time, Mizell had just eight years of experience practicing law meaning that she had not even yet completed the nine and a half years of practice that Jones Day typically requires for its lawyers to become partners of the firm. That's not that important that she not be a partner, really, but I think that's probably something. I wonder how often uh, that would be something. I bet you she's probably the only one. Like, how many times have any administrations uh, appointed to the federal bench People who hadn't made partner yet at some of those firms where it's formulaic like that. Now, how many associates from Jones Day have been appointed to the bench? I don't know. Usually you have to get a little bit further. And also, by the way, what, practicing law for eight years. By the way, is that uh, so did she just when they say practicing law, I don't know that she like had a shingle out or anything or even was working for Jones Day. I think she was a clerk. I think she did like four clerkships, which is impressive and all, but that's. That's not the same thing as practicing law, but okay, whatever. Anyway, she's very inexperienced. But what Mazelle lacks in experience, she made up for in her ability to rack up conservative credentials. In addition to her Thomas clerkship, Mazelle clerked for two other prominent members of the Conservative Federalist Society. At a 2020 speech to that organization, which, uh, you know, she's very young to be speaking to that organization, she quipped that... Paper money is unconstitutional. I think we touched on this the other day. That uh, she, because, you know, her reading of the Coinage Act. Well, coinage means coin, so there can't be paper money. He says she was joking. I don't know. I mean, she said she probably was, but she might also believe that or be willing to say that she does if she thought there was a big win in it. Mizell was also nominated by a president who was about to be repudiated by the American public. Trump officially named her in September of 2020, two months before Joe Biden defeated Trump in both the popular vote and the Electoral College. The Senate confirmed her while Trump was a lame duck a week and a half after the election was called for Biden. Mizell's opinion in the Health Freedom Defense Fund versus Biden, that case striking down the mask requirement, is so poorly reasoned that it's difficult not to suspect that it was written in bad faith. That's what I'm saying. Its primary argument is that federal law permits the CDC to require businesses to clean up contaminants that can spread disease, but that the law does not permit the CDC to actually prevent such contamination from occurring in the first place. But to arrive at this interpretation of the law, Mizell takes extreme liberties with statutory text. Maybe we should have the EPA require the masking then. 
I do not believe that Judge Mazel is as incompetent as her opinion suggests. Yeah, probably not. When Mazel was up for Senate confirmation, the American Bar Association determined that she, quote, has a very keen intellect, a strong work ethic, and an impressive resume, despite the fact that she lacked enough experience to be traditionally qualified for the federal bench. That's what the not qualified was about. Not that she's dumb. She didn't have enough experience. By all accounts, Mazel is a smart early career attorney who could be a very effective advocate. Neither Justice Thomas nor Jones Day have a reputation for hiring rank and competence, though the former, in particular, is known for hiring hardline conservatives. So there is that. We'll take a break here, be right back, finish the rest of this, and then uh, we have another web for you. What's up, fam? It's your boy Darwin, a.k.a. Darwin underscore Darko, a.k.a. the most reasonable man in America, a.k.a. KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and we Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organizations strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept a life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Kegor in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. You know, as I get ready to uh, try to weave all these important stories together that are affecting the direction of the country and the future of democracy, I'm bothered every day for whatever reason by seeing at the top of the, I don't know, in my uh, Twitter feed here on the side gutter of the uh, <clears throat> of their web page app, I just did the what's happening uh, thing, you know, I guess trending stuff or other topics, you know, I mean, not everything is politics, but just the, the annoys me that the top thing on the Twitter feed here, according to their algorithm, uh, algorithm under what's happening is all the action from the first weekend of Coachella 2022, which could not be less relevant to anything I care about. Uh, but as everyone, you know, it's some people, it's their entire world, apparently. And I can't believe it. And maybe that's why we can't have nice things. But who knows? Maybe if everybody was just into the music, then we would all leave each other alone. That's a possibility. Anyway, where were we? Ah, uh, yes. Ian Milheiser explaining uh, how I could launch into uh, weaving together so many of these stories. We were talking about the fact that he's pointing out, look, Judge Mizell is well-educated, not stupid, not as stupid as the opinion would lead you to believe, but that it's simply being offered in bad faith. She knows she can get away with it. She's willing to endure the embarrassment, if there is any for her, of looking like a dummy and looking like a, a pretender to the seat that she was granted. Uh, but that was the deal, right? It, we will give you this seat. We expect you to do these dumb things with it. Sometimes it's going to make you look like a dummy, but you got a paycheck for life. Plus your husband is parked in the Jared Kushner uh, bone saw fund over here. So that's good. You'll be making plenty of money. You don't make a ton of money, you know, in, in Republican world, a ton of money as a federal judge. It's just that it's a lifetime tenure. And I understand, you know, you went to law school, you clerked for a Supreme court justice. Now you have dreams of being a Supreme court justice yourself because you saw the lifestyle you get to dictate to everyone in the country, how to live your life. I want that as a Republican. So, you know, uh, the question is, if we give it to you at age 33, will you play the role we're asking you to play? Look like a dummy for the win. Will you do it? And the answer is yes. So, as Ian says, the most likely reading of her opinion, in other words, is that she simply disagreed with the Biden administration's masking policy and concocted a justification for striking it down. 
That approach should trouble anyone who cares about democracy, regardless of what they think about mandatory masking on planes. Yes, it should. But, you know, they don't care so much about democracy. And, of course, if you're a gimmitarian, you can even pretend that you're pro-democracy. I just want to, I want to win every question in democracy. In fact, that would be the most awesome democracy I could imagine. Sometimes I'll even vote on things. And when my friends and I win, we'll have some democracy. And when we lose, we'll you know, not have it. But then it'll feel like democracy to us because among us, we won. So, you know, what's the difference? Who cares? If everybody else suffers, just so long as I don't, that's close enough to democracy for me. That's basically all that's happening here. But yeah, it's, uh, it's bad for democracy. It's bad for the rule of law because there is no law. The law is what do the judges who are appointed by Donald Trump want to have happen? What could they wish for? And the answer becomes law. Mizell's in opinion is an abomination against textual interpretation. He takes up next. Health freedom turns on a federal law that empowers the CDC to, quote, make and enforce such regulations as in its judgment are necessary to prevent the introduction, transmission, or spread of communicable diseases from foreign countries into the states, or possessions, or from one state or possession into any other state or possession. It's a long-ass way of saying that, in other words, the CDC is empowered to make regulations to do exactly what you would think that the Centers for Disease Control would be able to do. But, you know, Mazel says, nah, the opposite. This statute also gives several examples of actions that the CDC is allowed to take including regulations providing for inspection, fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, pest extermination, destruction of animals or articles found to be so infected or contaminated as to be sources of dangerous infection to human beings, as well as any other measures the CDC determines, quote, may be necessary. Well, pretty broad. But how about if we just say no anyway? So, this law is broadly worded, and it specifically gives the CDC the power to enact sanitation regulations that protect public health. Mazel gets around the law's broad wording largely by defining the word sanitation very narrowly and misreading other portions of the statute. Uh, that's all there is to it. We just I read that to be the opposite of what everyone else says. But that's so dumb. Yeah, well, I'm a judge, and I order it now. Yeah, well, then we'll appeal. Oh, well... Actually, we won't because we're afraid that uh, other uh, bad faith jerks will just say, oh, yeah, 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 I do want that. And then we'll be stuck with that as the law from now on because that is what we say the Supreme Court gets to do. And what about when it's perverted and turned on its head? Eh, that's what the founders intended. I don't know. I don't know what we, we say to that. Apparently, we say nothing. Well, anyway, so next up, the word sanitation doesn't mean what Mazel says it means, just as we said yesterday. Mazel begins her analysis by arguing that this list of examples limits the CDC's authority to make regulations, an assumption that, in fairness, is grounded in the Supreme Court's interpretation of the statute. Thus, according to Mazel, if the law authorizes the masking requirement, the power to do so uh, must be found in one of the actions enumerated in the statute's list of examples, which is an awfully narrow way of looking at things, but they call it textualism, so here she goes. The masking rule must be a regulation providing for inspection, fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, or something similar. But that shouldn't be a problem. The word sanitation appears right there in the statute, and the masking requirement is a classic sanitation regulation. Its whole purpose is to prevent passengers from spewing a dangerous contaminant into the air that can infect other passengers. And as Mazel admits in her opinion, dictionary definitions of the word sanitation do include measures that keep something clean, even though she doesn't believe it. She even quotes dictionaries that provide definitions, such as the use of sanitary measures to preserve health. Nevertheless, Mizell refused to give the word sanitation its ordinary meaning, instead claiming that this word's meaning must be limited, quote, to measures that clean something, not ones that keep something clean. I mean, it's just stupid and makes no sense and is from out of left field, but whatever. She's a judge, so there you go. Suppose, for example, this is just by way of illustrating how dumb the 
uh, her reasoning is that many toilets installed in airplanes had a design defect that causes them to spew sewage into the cabin. Under the ordinary definition of the word sanitation, the CDC could order airlines to fix these toilets to prevent passengers from being exposed to sewage in the first place. But, of course, so could the FAA, which I'm saying to Greg, really, let's go back and say the FAA has this regulation instead. No, 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 they don't have the authority. Oh, they don't? Okay, well, then how about the EPA two years later? They don't have the authority either. Oh, really? Well, what about uh, the FBI? Well, that's just facially ridiculous. Well, that's what we're saying. Take us to court. Do it that way. Anyway. Uh, but again, so suppose the toilets spew things into the cabin. The CDC could order the airlines to fix the toilets to prevent passengers from being exposed to sewage in the first place. But under Mazel's definition, the CDC would have to wait until passengers were wading through feces before it could order the airplane to clean it up. Can't keep things clean, can only clean up the dirt. Mazel reaches this creative interpretation of the statute by pointing out that the word sanitation appears in the same company as other words, such as fumigation or disinfection, which involve the removal of existing contaminants and not preventative measures. So, who cares? Well, she says, words grouped in a list should be given related meaning, which is actually apparently a quote from a 1990 Supreme Court opinion, about which I know nothing. Which opinion was it? It's linked here. Dole versus United Steelworkers. Why did they say it that way? I don't know. It's probably dicta and doesn't belong in this decision, but there it is. Once the Supreme Court said that words grouped in a list should be given related meaning, and so I'm going to say that too. So what related meaning? Well, half of the meaning is what I meant. Now, sanitation only means cleaning things up, not preventing contaminants from spilling. But beyond semantic sophistry, Mizell offers little explanation for why the common element uniting words like fumigation and disinfection is that they involve efforts to clean something up that is already dirty. It just doesn't explain it. Who cares? But well, you look like a dummy. Uh, but I won. Another element uniting these words with the word sanitation is that they all describe ways to prevent people from being exposed to a disease such as by requiring people to wear masks so that they don't readily spew COVID germs into the air. Mazel also briefly notes that the statute CDC relies upon to require masking has historically been used for more modest regulations, such as quarantining infected individuals and prohibiting the import or sale of animals known to transmit disease. But COVID-19 is the most serious public health crisis since the late 1910s and arguably the most serious crisis of any kind to face the globe since World War II. So it's unsurprising that the CDC used its authority a little more aggressively to confront the historical crisis than it did to fight more ordinary diseases. And really, why on earth would Congress write a statute to permit the CDC to clean up a mess, but forbid it from preventing that mess from occurring in the first place? As Mazel's opinion shows, a lawyer of sufficient ability can offer a legalistic justification for nearly any result that they want, but that's not the role of a judge. The rest of Mazel's opinion is even less persuasive than her interpretation of the word sanitation. In case there's any doubt that Mazel is not operating in good faith, the next segment of her opinion erases such doubt. Mazel invents a distinction between CDC regulations governing property and CDC regulations governing an individual's liberty interests that is directly counter to the statutory text. As explained above, the CDC's power to require masks on mass transit flows from a statute, it's in 42 U.S. Code Section 264A, which permits the CDC to make and enforce such regulations as, in its judgment, are necessary to prevent the introduction, transmission, or spread of communicable diseases. Mazel claims that this provision of the statute must be read to only permit the CDC to regulate property because it is followed by three other provisions, uh, sections B through D of the same, that give the CDC power to directly impose on a, an individual's liberty interest. But this reading of the statute is plainly wrong. This is interesting. So I guess basically she's saying Section A deals with their ability to make regulations regarding property, and B through D apparently uh, deal with the ability to make regulations that impose on individual liberty interests. And if they cited A... 
when they should have cited B, then that's that. It's all over. Everything's unconstitutional. But, unfortunately, this reading of the statute is plainly wrong. The provisions she cites are placing limits on the general authority over property and individuals that is granted in the first part of the statute. To illustrate, read the text of one of the three provisions Mazel describes as giving the CDC authority over individuals. It reads, Regulations prescribed under this section shall not provide for the apprehension, detention, or conditional release of individuals except for the purpose of preventing the introduction, transmission, or spread of such communicable diseases as may be specified from time to time in executive orders of the president upon the recommendation of the secretary in consultation with the Surgeon General. Unlike the primary provision of the statute, which gives the CDC power to make and enforce regulations, this later provision contains no language authorizing the CDC to do anything. Instead, it places a limit on the CDC's power to issue regulations under the primary provisions. The primary provision gives the CDC the power to issue regulations limiting individual liberty, while the subsequent provision says the CDC must satisfy certain conditions if it wants to apprehend, detain, or conditionally release an individual. Release. That's the opposite, actually. The other two provisions that Mazel relies upon, which can be read here in the link, similarly place limits on the CDC's power to issue regulations, but they create no distinction at all between property and individual liberty as Mizell suggests, in any event. There's no need to get into the weeds here, too late for that, but the point is that while federal law does place some explicit limits on CDC's authority, CDC's, there is no language whatsoever suggesting that the CDC's sanitation regulations only apply to property. Mizell appears to have just made this distinction up. The elected branches, and not judges, should, of course, decide public policy. In fact, that's quite the Republican position, usually, except when they're being gimmitarian about things. Although current polling data specifically on airplane mask mandates is hard to find, a Harris poll from early April found that 60% of people wanted the transportation mask mandate to be extended, and only 21% strongly opposed it. Other polls, however, suggest that mask mandates more broadly are starting to fall out of favor. An Axos Ipsio, Ipsos poll, Axios Ipsos, <sighs> which was released last week, found that the number of Americans who support their state or local government requiring masks in all public places has also dipped below 50% for the first time. Now, 44% support such a requirement, down from 50% last month and 67% at the beginning of the year during the height of the Omicron variant. And I guess uh, down after all of the op-eds saying, but we want to pretend it's over, so let's do that. Republicans like Mazel, however, have long supported rolling back mask rules. A February Ipsos poll found that nearly two-thirds, 64%, of Republicans support government entities lifting all restrictions, compared to just 23% of Democrats. In any event, regardless of whether Mazel ruled the way she did because she wanted to substitute conservative policy preferences for the Biden administrations, or because she believed that popular opinion was on her side, this is not how a democratic society is supposed to function at least not the judiciary in it. In 2020, the American people elected Joe Biden president. That means Democrats will have an outsized say in determining America's public health policy for the duration of Biden's tenure in office. If the voters decide that Biden handled this responsibility poorly, then they'll have the opportunity to swap for a different president in 2024. The accountability moment, as Republicans used to call it, right? The appointment of Mizell and other similarly ideological judges by Trump was intended to short-circuit this democratic process, Trump gave dozens of Federalist Society stalwarts the power to block literally any federal policy. And so it's not just this one that we won't be able to appeal if we're afraid of what the Supreme Court is going to do. It's going to be others over and over again. And specifically, he concludes, uh, especially rather, in the public health context, Trump's judges are using this power quite aggressively. That's the end of that article. That brings us to transition time to some of the other items I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, I mentioned that there was another uh, story, I guess, when I was speaking about uh, the Supreme Court and the judiciary and the perversion of things before launching into Ian Milheiser's article. It reminded me of something else that happened yesterday, which was that apparently uh, Joe Biden has, this is uh, great paperwork stuff, procedure stuff. 
Joe Biden yesterday signed Judge, now, well, not yet Justice, but soon to be Justice Katanji Brown Jackson's commission to the Supreme Court, right? So you nominate somebody, then they have a confirmation hearing, and then they are confirmed to the Supreme Court, and then at some point, notice of that is given to the president. The president then signs a formal commission saying this person shall be admitted to the bench as a member of the Supreme Court. That's the official uh, document that does it. But you will recall, of course, that this whole thing was predicated on Justice Breyer retiring at the end of this session, retiring in the summer, right? And that there's no vacancy yet until he retires. But the fact that he's announced his retirement and his plans is what the body politic takes as the cue that is now acceptable to begin considering a successor's nomination. Now, usually the confirmation comes a little closer to the vacancy, either because someone dies or in office or because the uh, retirement is it moves quicker or because they delay the confirmation hearings until closer to the point when the vacancy is going to occur. But there's no particular reason that they do that, I don't think. Maybe that's just been practiced. But now we have a situation where it's still a couple of months. Breyer will still be on the court for another couple of months. And, but everybody knows, everybody sort of generally acknowledges, it's a general, generally accepted that he says he's going to retire, we believe that, and so therefore there's kind of a vacancy, and we might as well fill it ahead of time. No harm done, because she's not actually going to serve on the Supreme Court until he leaves, so fine, everybody just sort of accepts it. But apparently, you know, somebody asked, well, what is this deal? You can sign her commission... Uh, well, how is it that you can sign a commission if there's no actual vacancy? That came up. And yesterday, Steve Vladek, a name we frequently hear on the show, uh, tweeted out that there was a new answer. An April 6th OLC memo concluding that President Biden can sign Judge Jackson's commission while Justice Breyer remains in office because, anyone want to guess? Because it's only... The swearing of the oath, the oath of office, once the office is vacant, swearing of that oath, that is what allows her to formally assume her duties, not the signing of the commission, which is interesting and takes us way back uh, in a number of ways. For the more general, it brings you back to, I guess, Marbury versus Madison, which was the whole thing turned on the signing of commissions by the previous president. And interestingly, uh, I bring that up just as general background, but I was commenting, this is another validation of my own pet theory. This is my John Eastman moment here. Uh, I've been working on this for X number of years, just like uh, nursing this pet theory, just like Eastman has. Another validation of the critical importance of the swearing of the oath, that it's not just a formality and it can't be foregone and it does apparently in some people's minds, I guess when you need it to, I don't know how heavily this has been tested, but the swearing of the oath is legitimately regarded in many contexts by rather serious people who you're supposed to regard as controlling in these things. The OLC, for God's sake, says the swearing of the oath is what begins a term in office. You know what I'm talking about if you're a long-time listener. My John Eastman crazy fantasy plan. You know, I don't know whether I really thought it was a good idea to do. I was just throwing it out there. But remember back when back when people regarded Merrick Garland as a victim and so therefore viewed him more positively when he was a Supreme Court nominee, when he was nominated by Barack Obama, and the Republicans in the Senate refused to move forward with his uh, nomination and confirmation hearings and everything. So it was never going to be brought to a vote. You remember, he, they stole the seat and gave it to Neil Gorsuch instead. And now we can't appeal the mask mandate because Neil Gorsuch, among others, is sitting there waiting to undo the thing, uh, willing to look stupid for a gimmitarian win. All right, fine. And I remember, you remember that I gamed out, well, what if on January 3rd, 2000, what was it, 2017, when in the ordinary course of things, 
then still vice president and therefore president of the Senate, Joe Biden, would have had the ceremonial, largely ceremonial duty of swearing in the newly elected and newly reelected senators whose for terms that had expired that day. And now there were new terms available and we knew who was elected to them and we had the certificates of their election. All of those things had been done. In other words, the commission had been signed, but Joe Biden ceremoniously would be then swearing those people in, administering the oath of office, thereby initiating their terms in office, prior to which they would not be sitting senators. Even if they were reelected to their own seats, the term for which they had served had expired at noon on that day, January 3rd. The new term also begins then, but all they had was news of their election and a certificate of election. What was missing? The oath of office. Yes, Joe Biden could at that moment have said, you know what, under the, uh, the Donald Trump rule that the vice president gets to do whatever he wants, you know what, uh, welcome to everybody, but before we get started, I just want to say that there's a few things, a couple of housekeeping items I wanted to bring forth. My friend Barack Obama, as it turns out, has just renominated Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court. I have that nomination here. Uh, before we proceed with the swearing in, uh, we do have a quorum to operate. The majority of the Senate is still sworn in and in office, two thirds of it. And as it happens, it's an overwhelming Democratic majority among the 66, 67 of us still left here. Uh, but we do have a quorum to do business. Let's handle the nomination of Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court. Everybody screams and objects, but eventually they say, sorry, there are 66 senators and the overwhelming majority of them are Democrats. And there's no such thing, of course, as a filibuster for the Supreme Court anymore. So let's do it. Boom. Uh, and uh, that's although I guess at that point there still was one for the Supreme Court, right? They hadn't uh, changed that yet or had they? I can't recall. I guess they already had. Yeah, that's right. So at any rate, uh, they go ahead and do that and install him on the Supreme Court. Or even if there wasn't one, then you uh, nuke the filibuster for the Supreme Court. Put the guy on the Supreme Court. Of course, he wouldn't, uh, you know, people reasoned he wouldn't accept it, et cetera, et cetera. And then you go ahead and swear in the new senators. And now, yes, they would have chosen to do something completely different. Uh, yes, they could, in fact, ask the House of Representatives to impeach Merrick Garland and they could have a trial for him in the Senate, but they would never get that two thirds and they'd be stuck with it. It would be super hardball. Anyway, the whole point was it was just fantasy, probably not good for the country or anything like that. But you may recall that the Federalist, the Federalist, who I assume, uh, I guess the publication is somewhat, maybe they're not related to the Federalist Society, but I thought it was a, their own publication. But they went crazy. Oh, this is not how it works. Another stupid lib fantasy, etc. The oath doesn't mean anything. The oath doesn't control. And now I've given you, I think since then, like six different instances have cropped up where, yeah, the oath actually matters. It makes a big difference and it's the determining factor. Just thought I would bring that up for you again and let you know. And by the way, I might as well just now that I'm not going to do the libs of TikTok thing until at least tomorrow. Maybe that's a Friday story. We can uh, give you one more detail in this. Something else I have uh, fantasized about on the air before. And that again, would also probably not be good for the country, but I guess is a plausible thing to do at this point. Uh, if you take this OLC memo and there's a little... Uh, bit of it printed here in Steve Vladek's tweet. You can take a look at it. it. Doesn't It's not a world shattering thing. It's pretty easy to understand. What now? So now it's okay, even when there's no vacancy, to consider a nomination and make a confirmation and even sign a commission, but doesn't violate any, it doesn't create any problems. There's no 10th person on the Supreme Court because the oath hasn't been administered. Well, why don't we take advantage of that? As I've fantasized before, why not now go ahead and appoint another six justices and let their commissions just sit there and wait for the next vacancy. Even if the next vacancy comes under a successor administration, a Republican administration, perhaps. And then at that point, if a vacancy were to open up, like what would they say? How would they handle that? If you said, oh, well, uh, that this person right here has been confirmed by the Senate and holds a commission, a signed commission to the Supreme Court. Obviously, 
that's the person who's going to move into that vacancy. Even though that person's commission was signed by Joe Biden, now former president, and let's just theorize that, unfortunately, President Trump now sits in the White House and says, no, 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 this vacancy occurred during my administration. I get to name the successor, and I'm sure he would just do that. And a lot of people would say, yeah, he's right. But here's a signed valid commission sitting here. But the commission wasn't delivered and acted upon during the Biden administration. Therefore, it's not valid. Ah, but that's where Marbury and Madison comes in. One of the original super cases of the United States Supreme Court said, look, those signed commissions are valid. The fact that they weren't delivered before the new administration came in is in opposite to that. Those are valid and ought to be delivered, and they should go ahead and do so. And that's the whole basis for judicial review. And if you don't think that those things are valid, well, then the Supreme Court, as it turns out, isn't all that important after all. So maybe it works out pretty well. Either we get six new justices... And if we expand the Supreme Court with a new Judiciary Act, then we can place them right away. And if not, they just hang around and wait, blocking the path to the the Supreme Court, possibly, for any other future president, which is where people would, of course, say that can't be constitutional. But if it's not constitutional, then neither was Marbury versus Madison correctly decided. And who the F cares who's on the Supreme Court because they have no power of judicial review. Oops, I think I just destroyed the country. Well, anyway, from NetworksRadio.com. Justice Putnam's coming you next. Listening to <laughs> He'll undestroy the country, I think. David Waldman. Yes, it's true. Of course, the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes up next. Uh, what does he begin with today? Ah, he begins with Michigan Democratic State Senator Mallory, uh, Mallory McMorrow and her fiery speech. And then, of course, moves on to the DeSantis situation in Florida. I think there's just no escaping these stories. We all have to cover them. Hear his angle next. 